All right, we're back at the Bitcoin Atlantis commentary booth. I'm Luke, and this is Knut, and we just had a great block organized by Troy, Clo Troy Cross, all on Bitcoin and energy. And Troy, at the end there, you said you were really proud of yourself or something to that effect. So can you tell us about why you, you, you felt like you did a good job? Um, well, my panelists did a good job, and that means I did a good job in selecting them. All right, so uh, yeah, we put, we put together, I thought, um, a unique narrative for this morning. Um, I've been to a lot of Bitcoin conferences and what often happens is you kind of an in industry insider talk, like you feel like you're at a corporate, um, sit in on a corporate, like, uh, update from the CEO, you know, this is how our company is doing. Here's our competition. And then everybody's going to like buy or sell your stock on the basis of that. Um, so that that's not what I wanted. I didn't want, I didn't, I, I didn't want a corporate, um, discussion of industry insiders talking to each other. I wanted to provide a framework, first of all, which I tried to do in the session that was so early, no one came to it. Um, you know, a framework for what, how to think about Bitcoin mining in general, what its trajectory is, how it's going to impact sy systems of energy and the environment broadly. And my own sort of cheat code for understanding that, which is it's a terrible business. Bitcoin mining sucks as a business. That was my premise. Uh, it, it has a fungible good that's saleable on a global market and is transported for free. And so margins for mining are always going to go to zero. And the only differentiator that really matters is the only differentiator that really matters for uh, Bitcoin miners is their power cost and ancillary streams of other kinds of streams of, of revenue, whether that's carbon credits or whether that's um, demand response participation or whether that's um, their heat getting paid for it. So that's my kind of overarching premise. Bitcoin mining uh, margins go to zero. Um, only the only miners that survive are, are miners that find either super cheap, nearly free energy or make use of alternative revenue streams or both. And we haven't really seen that yet, but I brought in a bunch of entrepreneurs who are making that future a reality. We're in a transition in mining between just simple large data centers that are slapped down wherever there's power and this moving to the edges of the grid to take advantage of unique situations, which are often not at the huge scale. Maybe they're a one megawatt um, landfill facility. And um, I brought in the real entrepreneurs who are doing it, engineers and uh, people taking risks with their, their lives, their time, their, their capital, their reputations. And, um, yeah, so there was a, and Daniel, of course, I'll let him talk, talk about what he did, but the, the section as a whole gives you an image of Bitcoin mining in transition and where it ends up is hugely hopeful. It's, uh, it's a place that Alana showed us in her films of, uh, bringing energy to people who don't have it to um, solving uh, problems of pollution, um, maybe driving the whole network carbon negative equivalent as, as Daniel, as Daniel claimed. Uh, it's an incredibly hopeful picture and it's a massive disconnect from where we are right now. So, yeah. No, fantastic to hear. And, and it's always great to end on the message of optimism. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, Daniel's whole, uh, whole talk, uh, Bitcoin and methane usage, and you, you've done a, a tons of this uh, analytical stuff. And your, yours is one of the first places I send people who are uh, skeptical of the environmental uh, side of things as well. So yeah, yeah, doing great work there. What do they say? Well, well what do they say? Well, most of them don't read it, unfortunately. So that's, uh, that's too bad. But if they did read it, hopefully- But at least you be... send them somewhere, so- Exactly, exactly. So can, can you explain uh, your, your talk today a little bit, uh, recap it, the, the Bitcoin and methane situation? Yeah, sure. So the easiest way to explain it is that in martial arts, the way that you overwhelm an opponent, particularly one who is very strong, is not to try and neutralize their attack, but to weaponize their strength against them. And so the equivalent of that in Bitcoin mining is we spend a lot of time trying to defend Bitcoin mining uh, with stats, with data, with charts. And I've spent a lot of time with charts and rationalizing, and it only works to some extent, right? Because you've got so much confirmation bias that you're pushing up against. It's hard and it's relentless. 
It's really hard. It's really, really hard because you're talking to people who don't understand how grids work, uh, who don't understand that a lot of energy in the world is stranded or wasted. They certainly don't understand Bitcoin mining. Mm -hmm. Lay it on top of that, they've had some a combination of misinformation, professionally produced misinformation, and some innocently produced misinformation uh, from people who have put out models which just show either an ignorance of Bitcoin mining or haven't been updated for some time. So you lay all those things together. Oh man, you're up against it. So I was looking for a super move. It's like, what's there's got to be a short way to do this. There's got to be a quicker way to change the narrative. And so that martial arts principle, I thought, well, hang on a minute. Energy consumption is not necessarily a bad thing. It's only a bad thing for the environment if it's linked to positive emissions. But if you have emission sources, which in themselves are carbon negative, then more energy consumption is good. And the way to do that is to use when emissions is actually your source of fuel. And you can't do that with every sort of emission. You can't burn carbon dioxide. That's not the way the chemical reaction works. But you can burn another methane, uh, another emission, and that's methane. Right? So if you burn methane, not stuff in a gas pipeline because that's carbon positive, but if you burn methane that would have gone into the air, that's carbon negative because you're stopping atmospheric methane and you're using it to power the future of sound money. So the talk really was just exploring how feasible is that? Uh, where does it work? Where does it not work? Where could you do it slowly? But where could you do it fast? Uh, and the discovery... When I went down the Bitcoin mining rabbit hole, I got very excited about landfills, particularly vented landfills, because there was an opportunity where there was a problem no one was solving, where a lot of the world's landfills could not sell power to the grid. And so it was providing a solution for the landfill owner, it was producing a solution for the environment, and it was providing a solution for Bitcoin mining companies because they got really cheap power. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, I mean, I love seeing this whole thing played out. I remember we started writing about it like five years ago and now yeah. all of these ideas, burning methane and, and, and uh, mining Bitcoin, it's actually playing out and it's just wonderful to see. And sp speaking of mining in general, there, there's a, a sort of a, a debate going on now on like how centralized it is and how um, we've sort of taken a stance on the show like we're um, in this battle between... Um, how much arbitrary data is good or bad for the for the time chain, mm. and uh, as we see a, a problem in in miners, solo miners, and smaller miners not really being miners, mm -hmm. but just being hashing salesmen. Mm -hmm. So, so they sell hashes to these mining pools, which may or may not be centralized. So, do you see a, do you see a problem there with arbitrary data and with centralization in in pools? Open question to either. Open of you. question yeah. to either one. I, a hard I, one. I, 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 that is a hard one. Yeah. I mean, um, stepping back a second. Yeah. I think that the sources of, da of, of energy that D Daniel is exploiting and also that I highlighted throughout the day are all highly decentralized. And yeah. some of the companies I'm working with explicitly say we are decentralizing energy and uh, hash rate. And that's their goal. Right. So, you know, I'm working with people like, doing, doing, uh, mining on residential solar. That's tiny and is, is super distributed. Um, and landfills are whatever, half a megawatt to 1.5 megawatts, a small landfill. That's, uh, what, what is, what is Riot's new, uh, Corsicana facility? It's like, I don't know, 700 or something, same like that. Uh, so that's like all, that's, that's like all of the available landfills in the U S equivalent, right? Well, whoosh. In terms of the megawatts, in terms of emissions equivalent, it, it split, flips pretty dra dramatically. But I would say there's two problems here that are separate. Yeah. One is that one is the hash rate itself being decentralized, and I think all the sources of energy that I'm looking at are helpful for that. Is it because they're literally not in a data center, so yeah, yeah. the government can't just show up and say, "I mean, imagine this is in it's in it's in every home with new solar." Imagine that. What, what, what you now have everybody defending a lower electricity cost on their own bill yeah. from, from mining in their own home, right? That's as good as it gets. And then, and then these other forms of stranded power also, also at a smaller scale, but in terms of the pool, 
that's another question, right? What are you just a hash sell, salesperson selling to a pool, and are you you're, you're not making decisions about putting blocks together? The pool is, and so there's still a threat. Is there is there still a threat to security there? Yeah, it's a separate problem, a separate yeah, yeah. solution. I yeah. think it has little to do with the actual energy. I guess. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard problem, and I don't have the solution no. to it. So so is it possible today if you're living somewhere to, to live a totally self-sustainable life with just solar panels or whatever, geothermal and a Bitcoin miner. And yes. that's all you do. Like, yes. I, I think, um, I think we're going to see massive grid defection yeah. in these failing grids. So look at South Africa, for instance, grids failing all the time. And they also have stopped net metering there. So they don't pay you anything for your solar. And they charge you a ton for failing power. That's it's up like it's it's as bad as like just having solar panels when the, when the grid fails all the time. Yeah. So you, you and and then there, the the money to fix those problems is charged to ratepayers, right? And for so we're we're watching grids fail and basically centralized power systems not being able to. It, it's fiat, right? Fiat, yeah. We have we have a problem of, of managing grids effectively and the cost for that mismanagement gets pushed down to like a homeowner. We're watching battery costs fall and we're also watching panel costs fall. I mean, almost at like a, a rate of computing increase. It's insane. The, yeah. the real energy revolution is in the technology of batteries and, and especially uh, PV improving. And that combination means that sovereignty over your own energy is now within reach because the grid is so terrible. They can't, you know, provide provide reliable power cheaply to you and you have this alternative means and yes bitcoin can help bridge that by helping you overbuild your solar and pay it off in a slightly uh lower period of time so i see self-sovereign energy uh, succeeding in places where centralized government energy is failing failing yeah i do think that will happen and i think bitcoin will and I, and I can imagine that some of this, some of this mining here in this situation will, is probably going to be a service provider who centralizes a lot of homes, but it, it could happen at the individual level. It could even happen. You could do a solo mining, you know, you can, you can solo mine with a bid X on your, um, um, op open source miner with your home solar and just play the lottery with it if you choose, right? Fascinating. And, and so to maybe to tie this into the point about the carbon neutrality of, of all this. Uh, I know this is a, an area where you've done uh, quite a bit of work here, Daniel. I, I, I see that you keep uh, you keep track of the the statistics of uh, how the Bitcoin network is, uh, it, how neutral it is. I don't know if I'm right, using the right term there, but uh, it, then, it's it's about fifty percent, right? And and climbing is that is that correct? Uh, fifty five percent sustainable energy. That's our estimate. Of course, no model's perfect. You you don't know exactly where hash rate is, but that's a pretty good estimate. And we try to be conservative. So it might be higher than that. We know there's some Bitcoin mining companies that are doing flare gas mitigation who don't want to reveal themselves. So we know it's higher than that. Uh, we know the emissions mitigation is higher than 7.5, but that's just the most reliable baseline we can get. Interesting. And so, so to, to kind of tie this all together a bit here, the, the incentive at the moment is, is going towards the energy sources that are the most economical. And it's also having an effect of it's the most economical is happens to be renewable. So thank goodness this is happening now, not 20 years ago, because if it's happening 20 years ago, the most economical sources will be coal and gas. Mm -hmm. So it's a historical coincidence and we're very fortunate. Uh, but if you look at the amount of off-grid mining that's happening, which is something that I monitor pretty closely, it's now 30% at least. And again, probably higher because the ones off-grid are the hardest ones to track, but it's at least 30%. And they have a three to one ratio of preferring to eat sustainable energy over coal base because it just happens to be cheaper most of the time. Not all the time. If you're in Africa, it's going to be gas. So not all the time, but most of the time. And it's trending more in that direction every year. Well, where does nuclear come into this picture? Where well, does nuclear come into the, you, you probably got, uh, you know, I'll say, um, theoretically, it's a wonderful partner for Bitcoin mining because it has terrific uptime. It, it costs almost exactly the same to run a nuclear plant at 100 capacity as 60. So um, Bitcoin miners can be a steady load that cut off whenever the grid spikes in its demand. And we, uh, we do have some instances of that where the miner gets really cheap power from a nuclear plant, two cents a kilowatt hour is what we're seeing. Um, but those are in cases where we already have a nuclear plant that's been built. And it, it's usually in the Rust Belt in America. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, 
like they used to have a, a big industrial base and residential base drawing that power, but we had population decline. We've had industry leave for China. And so we, we have nuclear power plants, which last very long, you know, they can last 70 years if they're refurbished. And they, they're basically over provision for those areas. And that's why miners are able to come in and get that cheap power. On the other side of building new nuclear, I'm unfortunately very bearish mm -hmm. um, because it's really hard to build nuclear, yeah. uh, especially in free societies. If, if, if you're talking about the United Arab Emirates or uh, if you're talking about Russia or I guess, uh, I guess Finland can do it, um, right? South Korea can do it. But the U.S., the last nuclear plant we built was one of the biggest boondoggles in the whole history of not just power, but the U.S. as well. You yeah. know, 10 years over, uh, over schedule and way over budget. It's the most expensive power that's ever been built. And even, you know, our, our plans for SMRs, like um, the, 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 the leading contender in the U.S., New Scale, was just, you know, their investor just backed out and it's now dead. It's like it, it, the timeline for that is so long. Miners are looking at like, the next having they want something like for the next four years maybe that that's even long they're looking two years right they're looking at the lifespan of a of a of a, of a new gen miner and they want their capital back N new nuclear takes like a decade yeah. to, to to build um in in the long run we are going to need a steady supply of power in order to make renewables work we need base loaded whether that's geothermal i'm working with geothermalists who are into bitcoin by the way geothermal steady or hydro, but hydro is limited. It's just very limited. There's only so much water and there's yeah. so much gravity. Uh, nuclear is really the way to scale power um, th that's firm. And it can be done well technically. There's no problem, but is an incredible problem getting people together from all different groups and working together. That's government. That's all the manufacturers involved. That's the siting locally. That is an incredible challenge. Can you build things that are complicated? It's back to the grid. The same kind of organizations that cannot build a grid they definitely can't build nuclear power. No, the, so, so so this I I've thought about this a lot, and I've written about this as well because no, I need to I, read it. I used to think that like nuclear is a no-brainer because from a physics perspective, it is it's more energy efficient than anything else. And like, why not just build that and use the base load? But from a praxeology perspective, if you will, yeah. or from a political pers yes. perspective, it's not. The, it's very hard to build something the last fifty years because you get m movements different movements of people that want to change that and misinterpret it and want to close it down. And so, uh, yeah, maybe in the future with Bitcoin and people adopting a lower time preference and being more long-term in general, maybe we'll see something there, but maybe not there's, right now. There's someone on Twitter called, uh, his Twitter handle is Nuclear Bitcoiner. Yeah, yeah, we interviewed him. Oh, he's terrific. Yeah. He's great. Uh, he, he gave me a lot of my education on, on nuclear and we, we did a panel together and I watched and read everything he said to me, uh, which was really, I thought I knew stuff about nuclear, but I, I didn't, I, I, I do think, I do think there's a place for it in the future and I don't think we should give up on it. But I think like you be, just need a good stable monarchy, right? And then it's yes. going to work. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <Just, laughs> we'll we'll ask Philip but, about that. Did you care to expand on that? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. That's a discussion for another time. Sure. Sure. <laughs> And maybe to pull this a little bit more on the the local level here, uh, what's going on on Madeira? For, uh, this is this is a sort of a two-parter. How are you enjoying the the, the conference? But uh, we can also maybe talk about uh, the the um, power and energy stuff going on there. So so I'll start with how are you enjoying this conference and this uh, this beautiful place? This conference is amazing. Uh, I just, I mean, the the session this morning that was my favorite. I'm not, I'm biased because I came into I entered the Bitcoin mining rabbit hole before I entered the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And someone was asking me before, what do you think about other forms of cryptocurrency? And I said, well, I was very enthusiastic about Ethereum until it changed to proof of stake. And I, oh, that's interesting. Why? And I said, well, when it was proof of work, it was part of something that could mitigate methane. Now it can't. It's lobotomized itself. So it's now lobotomized its opportunity to ever go carbon negative, to ever be a form of climate technology. It's effectively useless to me. Um, and so there's basically Dogecoin, Litecoin, and Bitcoin are the only three out of then Bitcoin's 95%. Um, so I loved the session, just learning more about the incredible things that are happening with proof of work, Bitcoin-based mining. Uh, I'm very passionate about Bitcoin mining because I see it as something which is so near positive, not just to the environment, but to humanity. I'm incredibly positive about what's happening in Africa right now, the opportunity for energy abundance. Uh, when I watched... I wasn't in Africa, but when I saw the 
first African Bitcoin conference, I'm like, oh man, I've got to be there. I want to meet these people. And I'm getting to meet all these people who are like heroes to me because they're building out uh, a solution to how to bring energy abundance to a nation which currently has energy poverty. And what I'm learning is why that's a good idea. And I just watched Alana's film and I, and I was like, part of me, before you know, you don't know. So you're like, well, is bringing energy and electricity to Africa really a good thing? Maybe it's not. Maybe they'd be happier without them. Maybe they're just going to watch more Netflix and stuff. But then you see the real stories and you see this person being interviewed at a hospital. He says, because we have electricity, I don't have to do operations under candlelight and have them go out halfway through. Oh, that's probably a good thing if you've been operated on. Uh, yeah. yeah, because we have electricity, we can actually store drugs on site in a refrigerator. Oh, that's probably a good thing. Because we have big, uh, sorry, because we have electricity, we don't have to walk 20 miles to um, some mill. We can actually have a mill here. Oh, that's a good thing. And then you learn about how that's all been incentivized because of Bitcoin, because it's profitable. So what I really gained about this conference is just, and the, particularly the session, has been just how incredible the levels of innovation are uh, because you have this incredible thing called Bitcoin mining and it just drives innovations in the most unexpected ways. And I've already met three people who've told me three new ways to do Bitcoin mining that I just never would have dreamed. Uh, my favorite was doing direct air capture and using the blades behind it and sticking it, you know, mm -hmm. one of these ASICs behind it mm -hmm. and using that to call the ASIC as oh, yeah. you're doing direct air capture, and I'm just like, well, this is incredible. Yeah. Um, so I've just had so many conversations like this. I think it's an amazing group of people. I agree with Troy. Troy's done an amazing job. Uh, my job is also to do talent spotting. Um, like at CH4 Capital, we basically just choose a group of amazing people who know much more about it than I do. Troy's done an amazing job picking the talent and getting a great block together because uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And Madeira is just an awesome place to have, and I hope to come back here. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. That was that was great, by the way. That was a great little picture of oh, the, totally. the optimism here. Yeah, yeah. So Troy, Troy, thoughts I, on that? I really can't add to that it's, it's so much. Uh, I, I mean, I was here with Canute, uh, what was it, two years ago now? Almost. Almost, almost, almost two years. June, one and a half years ago. One right? and a half years ago, wow. When we started the whole thing. We started, yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's very special because those are special memories to me too. Uh, I had a wonderful time back then. That was what real highlight, yeah. a real highlight of and my And we had an epic, journey. epic walk in Lisbon afterwards. We did. <laughs> we had a walk that I'll never forget. It was wonderful. Oh, well, wonderful. Well, hard, Canute. It was same wonderful. Here. Right back as you. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so it's, 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 it's great to see it. This island too, you know, like we're still looking at possible energy solutions for this island. W what this runs on is, um, is uh, diesel from the Middle East. It's on ships. And this, they also have incredibly ambitious goals in Madeira, Portugal, and the EU for the energy transformation of this island. I mean, they, they want to make it a laboratory of renewable energy, uh, but it's really hard to do renewable energy on an island because you don't have one of the main tools that you use to take the edges off renewable energy, and that is interconnection to other grids. There's no interconnection here. You're on an island. So the intermittency in power production is brutal. And of course, they're looking at demand response participation by homes, you know, heat your hot water at the right time of day, Ele electric vehicles. They have some uh, pumped hydro storage here. They pump water uphill and then let it flow back down through a turbine, generate electricity. But none of that is going to meet anywhere near their needs of actually balancing the grid. Um, but it's also a very, very expensive place for power. So it doesn't really make sense for mining in the sense that this grid will always pay you more for any source of energy than mining would. Unless we're in the middle of a crazy bull run, you know, um, which we are, which we are, <laughs> we are, but hash rate is also, yeah. we're also in a crazy bull run of hash rate too. Yeah. So, um, but, but there's also, follows the other, there's also sugarcane on this island. A lot of it that could be, um, put in an anaerobic digester and isn't right now. There's also banana leaves, which is the number one export of this place. And so we are, we are actively researching how to get energy out of those forms of waste, which are right now, you know, uh, not, 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 not used. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe they could stop putting the bananas on the scabbard fish and like <laughs> use them for something else instead. Fantastic. A little bit of local culture. If you, uh, weren't aware of that the banana fish is an interesting dish. Yes. Um, I am yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, hey, hey, thank you both for uh, joining us to talk about uh, the fantastic block. Uh, great job, Troy, Daniel. Yeah, and thank you for, for joining us for this.
So we still have coming up a fantastic afternoon session on Bitcoin as it relates to human rights, uh, curated by Alex Gladstein. And of course, there's the open source stage where there's a whole bunch else going on. So you can see that stream as well. And uh, of course, day three, there's going to be a lot more going on. You can see the Bitcoin art gallery right now. Uh, I believe the the uh, auctions are going on today. Yeah, well, the auctions are going on all the time. Oh, online. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So check that out. Check that out if you're watching. Yeah, yeah. So you can bid from home. You don't have to be here. No, you, you know, don't. Art. You don't have to be here. And so check out everything uh, else going on at the stream and uh, get some uh, FOMO and uh, make sure to come next year. Come visit the island of Madeira and uh, stay tuned for the rest of the Bitcoin Atlantis program. This has been the commentary booth. Thank you again, Troy, Daniel. Thank you. This, yeah. is, uh, this is it. Thanks. Thank you.